Mr. Vice President, I thank you most sincerely for the opportunity to join in this debate. Um, I'll firstly begin by, of course, commending Senator Vieira um, uh, for his uh, presentation here today, reminding us as senators that this is indeed the upper house, and reminding me as a new senator, a relatively new senator, only serving here for approximately two and a half years, that that is equality of contributions that you expect from the upper house, because this is certainly not a Monday night forum or a show, or even the political hustings. Um, you know, I, I would immediately jump into some of the contributions because, of course, there are certain things that I have to address on the record that, that was placed onto the record by Senator Lachmidial. Um, you know, I, I want to share our opinion that Senator Lachmidial, she, she articulated that, you know, she sometimes feel vexed and she upset or, or something to that effect. Well, I, after listening to the Senator's opening comments, immediately I was vexed and upset because the Senator made reference uh, to viewing a Ram Leela not so long ago. And uh, in, talk, in addressing the Ram Leela, she spoke about the burning of Rawan, and she also spoke about uh, the not so recent decision made by the DPP that two Rams, two Rams were elevated. And as a Hindu, and a practicing Hindu, I will say to the Senator, that I know is two completely different Rams. And I will tell you why. For the non-Hindu non public, the Sri Ram that I know, um, Mr. Vice President, being a Hindu and understanding what the Ramayana stands for, the Ram that I know, because while, while, the senator, while the senator witnessed a Ram Leela, I narrated Ram Leela for more than 15 years of my life. And in narrating the Ram Leela, I understand the virtues that the Sri Ram in the Ramayana stood for. I understand that he stood for dharma. I understand that he stood for truthfulness. I understand that is what the Ram of Ayodhya represented. But the Ram that the senator referred to, the one of the Rams didn't make 11, my Ram did not make 11.9 million dollars in legal fees during the year of 2010 to 2015. Maybe her Ram did that, the senator's Ram did that. But the Ram in the Ramayana that I know did not, did not also collect legal fees for persons who were dead or deceased. Maybe her Ram did that, but the Ram that I know in the Ramayana did not do that. So I will respectfully submit to the Senator, but in your crease, if you do not understand the tenets of the Ramayana, do not make that analogy. So, so the same anger that the Senator felt, one could imagine as a practicing Hindu what I felt when that analogy was made in this honorable Senate. Also, also, Senator Lachmidial is so predictable. I, I, my, my good friend, Senator Lazama Lee Singh, reminded me that I wasn't allowed props. But even before entering into this budget, I did do a prop, but I, I understand the standing orders prevent me. And what I did, I knew I was coming after Senator Lachmidial. I, 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 I draw a line down my paper, I write Farris on one end, and I write fees on the next end. Because I know that is the only thing the Senator was going to come into the Senate and make a contribution about. Farris and fees. Nothing else of value to uplift this country. Nothing, le uh, nothing of substance to lift the people of this country. So my paper was divided into Farris and fees. The next prop that I prepared, which I know I can't present to the people of Trinidad and Tobago because, of course, again, my friend reminded me that the standing orders prevent, pre would prevent me from doing that, was a prop, a prop where I wrote $137 million, 20 15 inherited UNC legal fees, but again, a car presented to the public, because that is what we at the Office of the Attorney General inherited when we assumed office in 2015, a hundred, approximately $137 million in legal fees, fees that was accrued during the UNC tenure in office. So again, again, Mr. Vice President, I was not surprised, I wasn't taken aback, all the fire and the flame that the, the Senator displayed. I know it was Farris fees, and that would have been the end of she the, Senate, the Honorable Senator's contribution. Anyway, Mr. Vice President, but there were some critical statements made. There, there were also another contribution as it relates um, to, to fees again. 
And uh, I have to remember that I'm also speaking to the good people of Trinidad and Tobago. The people of Trinidad and Tobago who are logged on to this debate because they don't want to hear, this is not, again, this is not the political hustings. This is where we are here to report to the people of Trinidad and Tobago for they to understand where their monies have been spent. And I want to make reference, Mr. Vice President, to a document that was laid by the previous Attorney General in another place. It was laid in this parliament. And it was a document, it was laid in the parliament, it was the 2nd of July, 2021. And I think it covers a snapshot of what has happened in the office of the Attorney General. And if I may, if you may permit me to read into the record, because it speaks to expenditure and it speaks to the kinds of savings that took place in the office of the Attorney General under a PNM led administration, as opposed to what happened in a UNC led administration. And in that particular document that was laid in the Parliament, if I may quickly read it said at the onset the office of the attorney general and ministry of legal affairs is able to report that the government has achieved a saving of some 2.2 billion in expenditure 2.456 billion in expenditure and listen because of what by the simple reorganization of three ministries um, into uh, of three ministries into one umbrella ministry. And that is where what we would have had under a UNC administration was an office of the Attorney General, the Ministry of Legal Affairs, and the Ministry of Justice. There was a minister in every ministry, a minister collecting a cabinet salary in every single ministry. What we did as an effective administration was consolidate all three ministries. And that report that was laid by the Honorable Faris al Rabi when he was then the Attorney General, it spoke about that simple amalgamation, what it says, um, the Appropriation and Supplementary Appropriation Acts for 11-year period 2010 to 2021 demonstrate that for the period 2010 to 2015, the three separated ministries incurred expenditure in the sum of 4.585 billion, while in comparison for the six-year period 2015 to 2021, the Office of the Attorney General expended a sum of 2.129 um, 938, which, which is, sorry, two, $2.129 billion. So we clearly seeing whereby from the get-go of the PNM administration coming into power and, and serving in the office of the Attorney General by consolidating three ministries, which as I said before, three separate ministers, three separate expenditure, we were able to cut the expenditure significantly. Another thing that I want to make reference to, and I wouldn't get into too much detail because I will leave it for my honorable and esteemed attorney general to get into detail was the talk about since this government since since in, in the office of the attorney general uh, making reference to the point that we don't win cases and we don't win matters of course depending on the nature of a matter I have been an advocate in the court and you know I always have a friend come in here and talking about the criminal court criminal court and I often wonder what really kind of experience um, that, that she alludes to about having in the criminal court huh? The one who practices the law and, and really go to court and practices criminal law, you understand that matters can go anywhere based on the evidence that you have. So if you lose a matter in the criminal court, maybe it's just a very astute defense counsel on the other side. Maybe evidence was not presented in a particular way. But notwithstanding that statement, what I want to read into the record, which also came out of that report that was laid on the 2nd of July, uh, 2021, by the then Attorney General, and this is just to remind the members of the public, because I am reminding myself as well that I'm speaking to you, the good people of Trinidad and Tobago, in respect of the pursuit of matters in relation to the construction of the highway to Point Fourteen, the Office of the Attorney General and the State Enterprise secured recovery of approximately one billion U.S. dollars, and that's one matter with a cross claim of approximately. Approximately 
million TT dollars while defending claims against the state close to 250 million in other matters relating to the same project. All of these matters relates to events um, occurring prior to 2015. In respect of one claim for breach of constitutional rights commenced in 2015 relating to matters prior thereto, the state involving damages, the state involving damages over 80 million, the Office of the Attorney General and Ministry of Legal Affairs achieve a savings of 30 million TT dollars in damages. And, and, and that particular report, of course, I have a lot to report to the people of Trinidad and Tobago. That report, and I read it into the Hansard, that report of the 2nd of July, 2021, it's a report in which the then Attorney General, of course, would have explained uh, to this country and to this Honorable Senate, and not this Honorable Senate, sorry, this Honorable Parliament, um, what was happening as it relates to expenditure, as it relates to legal fees and all of that. So, you know, just piggybacking again on what uh, Senator, just piggybacking again on what uh, Senator Lachmidial would have said, you know, in in her in her in her uh, political speech, where she reminded the people of this country every time you stand by the fuel pump, she spoke about what kind of fees we spent. I want to remind the people of Trinidad, and I'm borrowing from her speech. Every time you stand by the fuel pump, remember the 11.9 million dollars one of the Ram make. Every time your children have to drive on a halfway road, remember the $137 million in 2015 that Trinidad, that we as a government inherited and had to deal with those fees. So, Mr. Vice President, that is that is the extent to which I will deal with those issues because I appreciate that I have to report and I have a responsibility now to report uh, um, as we in the upper house and senators would do so that the people, to, to, to have a conversation with the people of Trinidad and Tobago so that they have a sense um, as to what their government has been doing. You know, Mr. Vice President, let me take the opportunity to make reference to a very, in preparation for this debate, I came across a quote and it said, leaders must be courageous enough to make tough decisions and ensure that the relevant people understand why the decisions are being made. As more tough decisions need to be taken in the future, please ensure that the implications are explained clearly to the population so that they could buy in and they would support. And believe it or not, Mr. Vice President, this quote was taken uh, from uh, um, it's page 39 of the Hansard of a 2020 debate uh, of an appropriation financial bill 2021 by our very own independent senator, Dr. Dylan Remy. And when I came across that particular quote, Mr. Vice President, it reminded me of my responsibility um, of being a part of the government, so therefore being a part of the leadership of this country. It reminded me of my responsibility to engage in a conversation with the people of this country, this beloved country, so that they understand exactly what has been happening in the ministry. To that, to that, using that quote and springboarding off of that quote by the Honorable Senator Dr. Dylan Remy, to that effect, I must, I must express that the Prime Minister as a leader of this nation is courageous to make those tough decisions, to ensure the stability of our beautiful country. Piggybacking again all out of that quote made by Dr. Dylan Remy, where leaders must be courageous enough. I must acknowledge um, the Minister of Finance for making and those tough decisions and being courageous enough to take the licks from different quarters in order to ensure that we can secure a future for this country. So it would have been remiss of me if before I jump into my presentation, I did not acknowledge our Prime Minister and I did not acknowledge our Honourable um, Minister of Finance. You know, Mr. Vice President, um, in preparation for this particular debate as well, uh, it brought me to a statement that was made on the 30th of November 20, 2008, and it was a statement by our previous political leader, Mr. Manning. And Mr. Manning said, government has a special responsibility to ensure that our economy is kept in motion, the people kept employed, and the social fabric kept strong. And uh, now in preparing for this presentation, 
on, um, I decided that I was going to look at the Office of the Attorney General and the Ministry of Legal Affairs. And how is it, or how have we over the years, um, or within the last fiscal, how we have been able, as a, how we have been able there to ensure that our economy is kept in motion, the people kept employed, and the social fabric kept strong. Now, of course, if we go through the length and breadth of the different ministries, you would find that, okay, for example, what happens in the Ministry of Trade and Industry may be more relevant to Mr. Manning's quote, God bless his soul, as it relates to government's responsibility to ensure that our economy is kept in motion. But believe it or not, even at the Office of the Attorney General and the Ministry of Legal Affairs, which again, I am so blessed and privileged at this stage in my life to have the opportunity to serve the good people of this country in. Um, even at the Office of the Attorney General and the Ministry of Legal Affairs, some of the policies and measures we have implemented, I can say, also in, in some way or the other, contributes to keeping that economy in motion and more so in keeping our people employed. Beyond keeping our people employed, what I can also say, we have implemented policies at the ministry that also keeps our people employable. And it keeps our, because we have a relatively young legal staff throughout the length and breadth of the ministry. And this, to this end, Mr. Vice President, what I want to turn to is the human resource aspect as it exists in the ministry, in the Office of the Attorney General and the Ministry of Legal Affairs. Mr. Vice President, and of course for the benefit of the viewing and listening public, the Office of the Attorney General and the Ministry of Legal Affairs, uh, we employ a total of 2,036 persons. And the figure comprises, of course, contract employment, short-term contract employment, and of course, public servants as well. Now, in this ministry, Mr. Vice President, again, for the benefit, uh, uh, because again, we are counting to the taxpayers as to where your money is spent. Throughout the length and breadth of, especially the Office of the Attorney General, that, that, that part of the ministry, we are looking at a total of 15 legal units and departments and 12 non-legal units and departments. So therefore, we, um, we, we, we have a significant amount of people that is under our remit. Now, in turning to what, uh, because I did mention, uh, at the Office of the Attorney General, one of the policy positions we have taken is to ensure that our people are employable. And what we do is that we do, we do considerably believe in investing in our people through training and continuous training mechanisms. Um, so what you would find, Mr. Vice President, over the last fiscal and this is definitely a policy that we intend to continue, is the development of our young professionals and our prof administrative and legal. Now, at the Office of the Attorney General, Mr. Vice President, we understand the importance of training and development um, of our human resource, as well as offering opportunities for other professionals to learn and, uh, of course, uh, you know, to develop themselves. Opportunities, for example, Mr. Vice President, the undergraduate and graduate internship program, where on a yearly basis almost 28 undergraduate students participate in, and they have an opportunity to learn um, from, uh, from, of course, legal luminaries within the, the parameters of the ministry. Uh, Mr. Vice President, the ministry continues, the Office of the Attorney General and Ministry of um, Legal Affairs, as we continue to build our human resources, the ministry partnered with the Scholarships and Advanced Training Division of the Ministry of Education to employ associate professionals. Now, associate professionals to the members of the listening public may be those young persons who win scholarships. And then, of course, they require a place to do their in-service. Uh, we open our arms to these young professionals, these bright young professionals who, who work throughout the length and breadth of the ministry. And what we also believe it engenders, that, that, that culture, within our young people of giving back and serving their country as well because we, you got a scholarship from the country. It is important for you to understand what it is now to give back to your country. And we are so pleased to have been partnering with the Ministry of Education as we bring these young professionals, again, recognizing at the Office of the Attorney General the importance in developing our young people who ultimately are the future of this country. Uh, Mr. Vice President, well, there's a continuous 
partnership with the Hugh Wedding Law School as well, where on a continuous basis for in-service training, we would have approximately 23 or more uh, in-service trainees from the law school who again have the opportunity to come into the ministry. And they don't learn from me because I'm a politician. I'm in a revolving door. So I hear today, I go on tomorrow. But who they learn from is the long-standing, who they learn from are the long-standing public servants and legal officers who work in the ministry. And of course, they have an opportunity in my, 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 my respectful submission to learn from some of the best lawyers that exist at that ministry. Again, apolitical lawyers, politicals who are not politically associated with any party, but simply officers uh, are who, or, or public officers who are lawyers who continue to contribute to the development of laws in this country. Uh, what we also have is training programs, Mr. Vice, Pres um, Mr. Vice President, that's where some of our expenditure goes into. Training programs offered to 150, this year alone, I believe, 155 staff members in the areas ranging, but not limited to competition law, training and research for legal staff. We even do Spanish as a foreign language, uh, a sp a Spanish training, because of course there are certain matters, especially immigration and those kinds of matters related to same, uh, where you may need your, your, your lawyers to also have that training in Spanish. Um, strategic facility management. So, Mr. Vice President, I'm, I'm happy to report to Trinidad and Tobago that as a part of our expenditure, we have been investing in our people. We have been investing in our... Of course, there is a lot more to be done. Um, I can also speak to having assumed office um, uh, as, the, uh, as the minister in that ministry. Um, I was given the full blessings by the previous Attorney General, and of course, I know I have the blessings of the current Attorney General where I would work with different departments throughout the length and breadth of the ministry and collaborate with the Judicial Education Institute, the JEI, to ensure that we can get further training for our lawyers, um, further training in, in areas of advocacy, training in legal drafting. Uh, I'm pleased to also, for the record, uh, place on the record that I'm currently in conversation with the Chief State Solicitor, uh, where he has presented to me a proposal with areas of further development uh, that he wants uh, uh, for his staff, recognizing, again, his staff is a very, sometimes, fresh out of Hugh Wooding Law School. Young, I was a young lawyer once, and I understand what it is, the, the learning of the law. Mr. Vieira is a lawyer. We have so many lawyers in here who understand the real practice of the law is really not on the books, and it's not in law school. It's the first day that you step out of school and you start practicing. That's where learning really begins. And in recognizing that, being, uh, of course, having gone through the process, um, and of course, coming from a background where I was a teacher myself, I understand the importance of investing in our young people working with our young people and of course giving them an opportunity to develop themselves. So I'm pleased and I'm sure that I will get the, the blessings of the AG uh, to work with other departments as we expand our collaboration with the Judicial Education Institute to ensure that we continue that training and building our human resource and, and building, um, uh, you know, because again, the office of the AG is the watch go, watchdog of the state and, uh, you know, building our lawyers so that they can indeed grow and prosper and certainly develop, um, develop uh, and go along the path that we want them to go. So, Mr. Vice President, that is one of the areas that I quickly wanted to report to the people of Trinidad and Tobago um, in accounting to you where your monies have been um, spent uh, in the office of the Attorney General because, of course, human resource, that development, especially for younger lawyers, is very dear to my heart. You know, in Mr. Manning, I, and I started off by making reference uh, to that quotation made by um, uh, Minister M Mr. Manning when he, our uh, then Prime Minister, uh, Mr. Manning also spoke about the responsibility of leaders in ensuring that our social fabric is kept strong. And I think in looking at this part, the social fabric kept strong, this is a part, that here we can see uh, significant roles played by the Office of the Attorney General. Mr. Vice President, the social fabric as we know of Trinidad and Tobago touches and concerns every single citizen, from our elderly to our dull star children. Mr. Vice President, when I think about the social fabric of this nation, I think of all our interactions, our structures, our laws, 
our belief systems and how we as a people come together. And I think more so about our laws and governance. And this area and keeping our social fabric strong, I believe that this is one of the fund one of the areas that the Office of the Attorney General and the Ministry of Legal Affairs plays a very, very critical role. And in looking at the role that we play, and of course the investment that we are continuing to make and as it relates to our expenditure, what I will now turn to is certain legal departments um, in, uh, in the office of the AG and speak to the work and their achievements and, and some of our work plans for the future. If I may now turn to the criminal justice unit, you know, we often, we, we even Senator Lachmidial spoke about, uh, you know, the criminal justice system being critical to her. And of course, it's critical and it's important to every single citizen of this country. And I am pleased, and I know so too is the Attorney General. And I, I know in his contribution, he would he would make reference to what has what his observances has been in the Criminal Justice Unit. But I want to personally recognize Mr. Vice President, Mrs. Farzana Nazir Mohammed, who's the head of the Criminal Justice uh, Unit at the Office of the Attorney General, who has the responsibility of leading a team again of very young lawyers who have given and continue to give their time and service to this country in whichever way they can in order to ensure that we really revamp our criminal justice system. Now, Mr. Vice President, this criminal justice unit as a part of our expenditure and achievements, what does this unit has done? They have collaborated with the Law Reform Commission and the Chief Parliamentary Council Department. And Mr. Vice President, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to report to this country they have accomplished the introduction and the passage of a significant number of laws over the past two years, working on policy and, well, at least the two years that I have been there because I could only report for the period that I've actually been in the ministry, uh, working on policy and legislation such as the anti-gang legislation, decriminalization of marijuana, improved sexual offenses law, pepper spray, uh, the parliamentary period 2021 to 2022, this unit, Mr. Vice President, have been instrumental in working on legislation that abolishes the year and a day rule. And we, we also came out recently of a special select committee that deals with uh, um, amendments to the Sexual Offenses Act, voyeurism in particularly, this unit will, in this unit was very instrumental in the orchestrating, creating the policy and the law as it relates to that area. Uh, Mr. Vice President, anything criminal justice, this unit occupies all its time and resources towards. For example, they have coordinated several um, implantation projects. Uh, for example, member of the 19... A member um, of the Nightingale Committee for the Implementation of Anti-Terrorism Bill 2022, which facilitates the return of nationals, uh, which are women and children from conflict zone. This particular unit, I'm pleased to report to the country, um, also sit as a member of the Wrong Table Drafting Committee for the National Action Plan of the Caribbean Firearms Roadmap, which attempts to reduce the flow of illicit firearms and ammunition with in the Caribbean region. Uh, the CJU unit, I'm pleased to report to the people of Trinidad and Tobago, has also tabled several bills for discussion at the Legislative Review Committee. And of course, I will not speak out of turn. I will leave that for the most distinguished AG to speak to when he uh, does his presentation as to what his plans for our legislative agenda would look like. Mr. Vice President, if I may now, in, 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 in having a conversation with the people of Trinidad and Tobago, report on the role and function of our anti-terrorism unit at the office of the AG so the people of Trinidad and Tobago could again understand where your monies and your resources, your taxpayers are, because I'm a taxpayer too, so I understand why the people of Trinidad and Tobago would want and that, 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 that level of accountability, and I'm pleased to account to the people of Trinidad and Tobago. Um, that your anti-terrorism unit at the office of the AG is alive and well. And again, I must recognize Ms. Viana Sharma, a very a young lady again, who is spearheading that anti-terrorism unit and is doing a remarkable work with her team in ensuring that, uh, you know, we fight, uh, that our fight against white color crime and uh, ensuring that we are compliant with international obligations are up to par. The anti-terrorism unit, Mr. Vice President, I'm pleased to report to the people of Trinidad and Tobago 
Chicago carried out training with several entities over the period of 2018 to 2022. Entities that received training, Mr. Vice President, range from Financial Investigation Branch, TTPS, Ministry of Foreign and CARICOM Affairs, SSA, University of Southern Caribbean, Immigration Division, to name a few. So what we have been doing and what we have been encouraging amongst these units is once laws are placed on the books, we are encouraging our units to now go out there and lend the training to, because we, we, we understand the law on a book is one thing. Operationalization is another part of it. And in recognizing that a lot of effort and time is the allotted by these units and now after piece of critical pieces of legislation are passed with working with other stakeholders to ensure that they understand they are sensitized so once the law becomes operational they have a full understanding and i would have already identified some of the partner stakeholders that this unit particularly works with um mr vice president there are also several legislative accomplishments are uh, coming from this unit at the office of the attorney general and the ministry of legal affairs such as the Trinidad and Tobago Revenue Authority Act, Trinidad and Tobago Special Economic Zones Act, the Public Procurement and Disposal of Public Property Regulations. All of those are things. Um, uh, of course, there are some areas that uh, require some further attention for operationalization, but I must commend this unit uh, for the hard work uh, that they continue to do in ensuring uh, that the laws and the social fabric of our nation is kept together. This unit, Mr. Vice President, works consistently to ensure that Trinidad and Tobago's international obligations pursuant to the Financial uh, um, Action Task Force, FATF, you know, we um, standards are also met. So again, uh, um, that is me just simply in a nutshell because there's so much to report on, but such a limited time, uh, just flagging some of the general areas uh, that these units are responsible for. And of course, I must commend them. Mr. Vice President, there's also a unit known as the International Office of the Child of Child Rights that operates out of the Office of the Attorney General and Ministry of Legal Affairs, um, where Trinidad and Tobago, your, 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 your taxpayers' dollars are spent in, of course, developing this unit. Uh, they have played a critical role in legislative reform to seek the amendments to the Act and drafting supporting regulations as it relates to children. Uh, just a few days ago, as a matter of fact, um, I saw that the International Office uh, of the Child uh, of Child Rights, uh, they would have also engaged in some training sessions. Again, training sessions uh, uh, which they partnered with, uh, um, which they partnered with persons from the Hague, uh, as it relates to the, uh, again training on on critical issues as it relates to international child, you know, international obligations on the rights of a child. So that is also another area, Mr. Vice President. If I now respectfully turn to the Environmental Commission. The Environmental Commission also falls in the Office of the Attorney General and the Ministry of Legal Affairs. Um, in this particular um, commission, Mr. Vice President, work is in progress at the commission as it relates to the law, analyzing the Environmental Management Act Chapter 3305 and proposing amendments that are in alignment with the international best practices for environmental courts um, that are targeted at maximizing the at the use and efficiency of the court. And of course, the weather that is ablazing all of us, nearly every single day, we understand how critical climate change is and addressing those issues are. So of course, kudos to the Environmental Commission that also forms part of our ministry. And to you, the people of Trinidad and Tobago, this is where your taxpayers' dollars are going in developing um, these units and ensuring that they're provided with the resources so that they can uh, you know, ensure that proper litigation laws are passed that could, of course, in enhance our experiences as citizens in this country. Going back again to what uh, Mr. Manning would have said, ensuring uh, that our social fabric is kept strong. Mr. Vice President, there are so many units, but the last unit that I would perhaps, two, two, two last units I would look at um, is the Central Authority, for example, uh, reporting to you, the people of Trinidad and Tobago again. This Central Authority unit is also presently engaged in looking into further legislation and administrative reforms under the Mutual Assistance in Criminal Matters Act to refine and to bring uh, the scheme of mutual legal assistance to the forefront of 
of contemporary international cooperation practices. So again, to you, the people of Trinidad and Tobago, this is the central authority. It's, it's alive, it's kicking, it's doing well, and it's a unit that operates out of the office of the Attorney General, which focuses, again, on critical pieces of legislation to keep our social fabric strong. And then, of course, it would be remiss of me if I don't recognize the Human Rights Unit. Uh, the Human Rights Unit, of course, critical to the, up, um, to the implementation of uh, critical human rights. Um, that unit, just about six days ago, Mr. Vice President, the unit would have partnered um, and were a part, this unit and members of our unit, just about six days ago, would have partnered, were invited, sorry, to speak at a model UN uh, United Nations uh, forum uh, in which they would, we would, we would have worked with students. That unit would have worked with students, training them um, on the critical areas of human rights. Again, that is uh, as the Office of the Attorney General and the Ministry of legal affairs. Senator Continue. Sukla, you have five minutes remaining. Thank, thank you very much, Mr. Vice President. Um, as we continue our outward reach uh, to the people of Trinidad and Tobago, Mr. Vice President, uh, um, uh, in looking at, so so as I would have indicated, those are the units from, from the get-go. Before I jumped into the units, I would have indicated those are some of the units and what they have been able to achieve and where the taxpayers' dollars are going in the office of the AG side. If I may now turn to the office, uh, the Ministry of Legal Affairs side. Um, on the, 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 the office, on the Ministry of Legal Affairs side, I have to recognize um, our very hard-working uh, Registrar General, Ms. Karen Bridgewater. Um, notwithstanding the trepidation of the pandemic and all of the challenges that she has faced, uh, she continues uh, to do her endeavor best uh, to steer um, that department, the Office of the, uh, the, the Ministry of the, the Registrar General's Department, uh, in the right direction. Um, notwithstanding, Mr. Vice President, the challenges that the pandemic had created, uh, this lady, the, the Registrar General, uh, and the Office of the Attorney General and Ministry of Legal Affairs, I'm pleased to report to the people of Trinidad and Tobago um, is also in the final stages of full digitization of a number of services at the Registrar General's Department. Uh, the Registrar General's Department, for example, Mr. Vice President, um, has a in the last few years, built out three integrated registries, uh, at the, which is the land companies and civil registries, uh, with uh, the replacement and upgrade of its processes and systems, Mr. Vice President, both hardware and so at both hardware and software levels. Now, Mr. Vice President, the ministry has already launched, and members of the public, I'm sure, are aware of uh, the PBRS system, which is the Property and Business Registration System, as well as its new company's registry online system, the cross system, uh, which both offer a seamless and user-friendly access. Now, I will admit that, of course, like with any technology, I mean, I will bat in my crease, and I don't ever pretend to understand technology, but uh, at least at this level, but uh, of course, we would have had our challenges once these systems went live. And as you understand, and as a country, I'm hoping will understand that once these, tech, these new systems come uh, go live. It's only then our technocrats may be able to fully appreciate um, what difficulties or challenges um, uh, you know they may have to now address their mind to. So certainly, um, I would not uh, I, I would not uh, pretend that these systems uh, um, have gone live without uh, um, you know issues. But uh, the tr people of Trinidad and Tobago can rest assured that uh, um, we are the the, the office the the Registrar General's Department continues it wo it, its work in upgrading these systems to ensure that, you know, we continue on the part of, of proper service delivery um, to, of course, you, the people of Trinidad and Tobago. And there are so much other, um, there are so many. I'm pleased to also report that uh, we have had shipments of our polymer paper. Um, and I am making reference to this in particular because I have social media, uh, my social media pages, and I know people, members of the public will often reach out to me uh, com with complaints about uh, you go to a particular office and you may not have paper, um, uh, 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 or this is, a, this is something that is, is, is said to them. I want to place on the public record that we do 
have in our possession the polymer paper, and uh, no citizen should have the cause to complain that they are unable to complete their transaction. A considerable amount of uh, expenditure has been spent uh, on securing uh, this paper to ensure that uh, the Office of the Registrar the Office of the Registrar General is, operates at its full capacity. And I am very, very pleased to report to the people of Trinidad and Tobago um, about uh, you know at least what has been happening in a nutshell. And that's very much a nutshell because again, Mr. Vice President, there's so much more I wish I had the time uh, to speak to. But uh, I must again. As I close off on uh, on the Registrar General's department, of course, commend the Registrar General uh, for the work that she continues to do. Um, Mr. Vice President, uh, you know, I, um, again, time will not permit me, but, uh, you know, I, di I do want to place on the record that I did hear uh, Senator uh, Dave Narine when she would have spoken about, you know, the, with such passion about certain things in previous budget debates she would have asked for. Um, uh, I, in particular, um, I know Senator Dana Ryan, um, I'm sure she would have been pleased when she noted that uh, at least, uh, and I'm sure Minister Gobi Schoon will deal with that, with the Forex, that it, I, I would have noted in previous budget debates, uh, she would have asked uh, for Forex and more Forex to be available. So while I know the Senator may be upset about certain things that this budget probably didn't satisfy, I'm asking every single Senator in this honorable chamber to look at this budget with an open mind. Um, there are several other senators that I had planned to make reference to previous budget debates where they had asked for particular things and identify how this budget in some way or other attempted to satisfy it. I don't have the time, but I'm just asking all of our senators to look with an open mind of the budget um, as uh, and, and, and of course listen to the government bench as we attempt to defend, not a budget, but to defend Mr. Vice President, making good decisions, making right decisions, making the best decisions for the people of Trinidad and Tobago. Mr. Vice President, I thank you.